let's uh, but let us move on to the to the last speaker of uh, of this session Vanessa Lambrecht yes okay so um, thank you very much uh, for giving uh, the opportunity to speak um, at the symposium I'm very grateful for this chance to make some noise about the Middle East and North Africa uh, I do not represent the region as such, uh, but I feel obliged to present the Middle East and North Africa in important fora like this. And in my presentation, I would like to show that many people in the Middle East and North Africa work on green topics. And I'm making the point that these young grassroots people working on green topics are a key force of change. I believe that Western actors should ensure participation from the MENA region to be inclusive in degrowth actions and in working for environmental justice. The region has sustained a century of growth in the West with cheap oil. We now need to support grassroots organizations and green actors in the region with their quest for a greener future. So my name is Vanessa Lambrecht. I'm not a biologist or ecologist or biodiversity expert, uh, but I believe in interdisciplinarity, uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary um, onlooks on, on problems. Uh, I studied Arabic and women's studies and I'm part of the Greater Middle East platform. The Greater Middle East platform is a platform of people in the Netherlands that have a special interest in the Middle East and North Africa. And we want to humanize the image of the region in the Netherlands. One of our current projects is called the Green MENA Network. And this network, uh, is a network of more than 500 green actors in the MENA region. Uh, with this network, we aim to make green partnerships central in foreign aid and policy, and we want to interconnect green actors in the MENA itself and connect them with European organizations, uh, researchers, um, NGOs, and with uh, relevant green actors in the region itself. Oil has been the focus of many Western governments, especially because oil in the is the main driver of growth. Oil was the reason for France, the UK and Italy to invade and colonize large parts of the Middle East and North Africa. It has also been the reason for neo-colonial support by the US and UK government speci specifically, and they funded Al Qaeda affiliated networks in Afghanistan and other countries after the Cold War. In this way, they try to counter Russian and currently also Chinese influence to extend their hegemony over the global capitalist economy. Both the Clinton and Bush administration sought to please the Taliban government, for instance, in order to provide stability to install a trans-Afghan pipeline and sideline Russia. Both oil and aid in the Middle East and North Africa focus on growth oil producing countries sell oil to finance economic growth and oil is energy needed to stay on top of the growth ladder. Governmental aid to countries in the region, for instance, to Iraq or Libya are also used to gain influence over oil production. Some have even called Islamic State a cancer of modern industrial cap capitalism and a fatal byproduct of our addiction to oil. The end of cheap oil ecological economists argue, will bring the end of the era of dramatic constant economic growth. The limits to growth, growth movement and the community of ecological economists were, was born in the 1970s, right after the big oil crisis. So the MENA region is entangled in a complex interrelationship between oil and other resources that are extracted from the earth money flows, geopolitics, and power. Degrowth, sustainability, and green, uh, and green are a way out of, for the Middle East and North Africa, a way out for many countries in the region from this position of being a pawn in someone else's growth game. The Middle East and North Africa is a very diverse region, and it is the direct neighbor of the European Union. We are also connected because of our colonial history, half a century of trade and current aid efforts. Although the region is very diverse, it is unified in its economic and social issues, migration, internal displacement, failing economies and failing regimes, 
put countries in the region under pressure and exclude the young population from participation on all levels. More than half of the population of the MENA region is under 30 years old, and nearly half of this young population group has considered leaving their country because they have no say in their own future. Governments and regimes in the region are dealing with these economic, economic and social issues and struggle to address them. Huge population, population growth, rapid urbanization, and a high rate of poverty push governments in the MENA to choose for economic development, growth, and jobs, instead of dealing with the collapsing environment. The region also lacks rigorous environmental institutions and legal frameworks that are essential to tackle environmental degradation. But among local communities in the MENA, there is a growing awareness of the need to transform societies to ensure environmental ju justice and a good life for all within planetary boundaries. Especially among Arab youth that have started initiatives that aim to deal with climate change and loss of biodiversity. Although generally associated with barren deserts with lots of sand, habitats in the MENA are surprisingly diverse, comprising of arid steppes, mountains, broadleaf uh, forests, salt lakes, Mediterranean scrubs, and large forests. The region has the world's most unique coastal and marine environments, consisting of a wide ra range of ecosystems, from arid coastal zones to coastal wetlands, mangroves and salt marshes, seagrass beds, and very extensive coral reefs. The Red Sea is the enclosed sea with the highest biodiversity on Earth. The Levant and parts of Iran are considered globally important centers of agrobiodiversity with a great variety in wild relatives of important food crops and pasture species, which are an important source of genetic material for enhancing food crops. The region's contribution to global diversity, biodiversity is considered to be very high. The population of the MENA region comprises of around 400 million people. A growing number of them already face the consequences of climate change and loss of biodiversity. And some want to do something about that. And we have made a short uh, clip um, that we used to show uh, initiatives in the region. And I am going to see if this... Really, the issue is to invest in developing people, and people develop nature and the environment, etc. The more we consume, the healthier our economy gets, but the more toxic nature and humanity become, and that is the paradox we are in. She assesses. Look, here we have she assesses. Mufid, safe, and we are If we want to really be free, we have to be more independent on the level of food production, energy production, water efficiency. We have major problems. I mean, other than the climate, the destruction that we have is much faster than what the climate will destroy. In 2008 and 2012 and 2014, I was subjected to three wars. Due to blockage, there was no access to building materials in Gaza. With the green cake, we started using ashes and wrappers from the destroyed houses instead of aggregate and sand. We developed a system that's called the Freedom Machine, the combination of hydroponic, aquaponic, farming methods, but it combines with it also other technologies. If we make our houses more energy efficient and more as production units, as just consumption units, this is the infrastructure that we need in order to have a genuine freedom. We have a sorting facility in Beirut. We take all non-organic materials, like we take plastic, paper, glass, metal. 
we are creating jobs for vulnerable people. Most of them are refugees, Syrians and Palestinian refugees. We produce uh, more than four tons of recycling every day, and these four tons are going uh, to other facilities, and these facilities uh, have more uh, workers. So it's like affecting in many ways. So a conscious platform where we are aiming to really drive a collective action for system change. We are trying to do this through redeveloping the Lebanese circular economy, which is important to us. So it's a user-generated interface. We've listed these sectors, which we, we understand as the sectors of change. For example, if you're interested in recycling, you can go in and start to see, oh, who's recycling uh, what? And you can go into more details, for instance, and start to see, let's say, in plastic, these are the people recycling plastic. And here you can see, you know, I have an edible garden, or I want to make an edible garden. It's highlighting the way that they can connect to the resources on the map that show you uh, where you can buy your tools, who you can get your seeds from. And it also highlights how we can, in the future, really develop this uh, local sustainability model. So these are some examples of uh, uh, projects, initiatives, startups um, from the region that focus on a green future. Uh, climate change and environmental challenges. Oh, go away. Wait a minute. Here. Okay. Climate change and environmental challenges are among the most important issues determining the future of the MENA region and also Europe's relationship with the MENA. Over the years, rapid economic development and the introduction of monoculture farming in the Middle East has resulted in the dramatic loss of biodiversity. Yet conservation in the region receives relatively little attention from struggling or failing regimes. Strangely, they also receive little attention from European or Dutch organizations working on conservation, biodiversity or climate action. International cooperation and aid efforts are mostly focused on classic growth and economic development. In refugee camps, for instance, job creation focused on building factories that produce consumer goods for the European market. And although they contribute to income for refugee families, in the long run, the cheap production of unsustainable goods that are shipped and do not benefit the local market is not a, ben a model that benefits the earth. Besides a few thematic and regional networks uh, for NGOs, there is no MENA-wide interdisciplinary network that connects entrepreneurs, activists, academics, and NGOs. Conservation International, for instance, works in Africa, the Americas, and Asia Pacific, but not in the MENA region. Bigger international uh, NGOs on climate, earth, and eco-justice in general do not have any representation in the MENA, nor any plans or strategies to do so or to become more active in the region. And we think this should change and more actors from the MENA should be part of international organizations, projects and think tanks. For the green actors in the MENA region, green is more than climate action or sustainability. In many of the Mediterranean countries like Lebanon, Palestine, Tunisia, a green future is also tied to decolonization. For instance, in the heart of the Algerian Sahara, a collective movement protested against shale gas exploration by the French company Total. The campaign claimed that Algerian citizens were confronting not only the environmental and health hazards of fracking, but also a form of neo-colonialism. While France has banned Total and other companies from fracking on its own territory, it is still pushing for it, for it in its former colonies. Following the Arab Spring, environmental activism has been intensifying in the region. 
The uprisings also gave rise to attention for environmental issues and people are taking advantage of the political opening that, had re that has resulted from the Arab, Arab Spring. They are organizing at grassroots level and enforce not only their political, social and economic rights, but also their environmental rights. Green is therefore also a new way to participate for women, youth and marginalized uh, communities. Grassroot movements up to today express the people's frustration and discontent with bad governance, low quality of life, corruption and marginalization. They are a response to and a rejection of the extreme forms of inequality and dispossession that have flowed from the shift to neoliberalism. More Vanessa, and more, yeah. May, if no, no, or, if already, like I already tried to show one, uh, oh. to be honest. And okay. so I was thinking if you still want to take any questions, then uh, maybe maybe this is a good time. Uh, so that we again can have a little bit of a break before uh, the next uh, keynote session. Yes. Okay. Well, let me let me just say that uh, what we need in the MENA region uh, post for reaching post growth is more cooperation uh, mm -hmm. to make uh, truly global uh, movements for change. We need to focus on grassroots uh, cooperation uh, and work with local and decentralized actors and uh, really take into account the local knowledge that is there. And we need curiosity. And like Sofa said, or, or uh, Iago said, move beyond the ego and discover, ask and learn from the MENA region and see what is already happening and uh, connect with that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your overview, Vanessa. Exactly. Virtual applause. Stop sharing. Okay. I do not see an immediate question. So with that, I propose that we uh, can and that Kenneth raises his question, uh, followed by a brief break. Kenneth, please. Yeah, very short question. Firstly, I'm really uh, happy to hear uh, to, that you provide uh, this uh, perspective, uh, Vanessa Lambrecht. Uh, and I think um, uh, it, it clarifies that um, we uh, need to put more effort to this uh, blind spot. So thank you for, for outlining uh, this. And concretely, what do you think, um, uh, especially in Europe, we could do to um, to improve, uh, well, to improve our interest in this region. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, I think um, the connecting with local actors, um, be it in grassroots organizations, but also on the academic uh, academic uh, level, uh, to really uh, understand and learn and see how we can uh, work together, but also do research together and learn from each other uh, is, think, uh, is a good way forward. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, 